Ladies and gentlemen, because there are only two biologies, I regret to inform you that Jason King, aka Kung Fu Hot Dog, has suddenly passed away at the tender loving age of 54 years old. It has come as a shock to his friends, to his family, to the superstars from Hollywood who knew him for a very brief moment in time. But apart from that, Jason was unmatched in his quality, his admiration, his determination to get those news videos out on YouTube before any of his rivals could even sniff their own farts. Jason King, the man who exposed the dirty truths about Disney Lucasfilm, how they tried to convince us that Rachel Zegler is your very own Snow White, smuggling in dwarfs from across the border of Mexico. But even more devastating and more tragic are the reveals of how Jason passed away in the loving, tender arms of A-list and Double D model herself, Miss Hayley Atwell. The police have cited motorboating as the cause of death. <laughs> the following program contains naughty bits. But before each naughty bit comes on the screen, You'll hear this warning sound. Woke! Woke! And then you can come on each other's faces and tell each other that come on your face hotter than this. And more exciting than this. Yes, friends, Thames Television brings you the test card. Not just your favorite time of the week, but also mine, where we do a big roundup of this week's woke news. And it's been the usual diatribe of delicious diarrhea that I can serve up to you on my silver plated plate. So what do we have here to kick things off? Blue Beetle described as a love letter to the multiple ways of being Latino and an epic celebration of diversity. Fucking hell, jeez. So this article here from Bounding Into Comics talks about one person called Victor Ramos Rosado, who saw the film and they're doing a translation from his Spanish, I'm assuming, a movie full of heart, a love letter to the multiple ways of being Latino. Yeah, 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 we get that. Uh, I mean, look, I can e eat a taco, right? And I'm not a Latino person and I can appreciate the, the, the complexity of that meal. Okay, so can Gordon Ramsay. And he's a white dude. So why are we celebrating the many ways of being Latino? Is it because you've been objecting to the stereotypes? I mean, how do Latinos feel about watching Speedy Gonzalez? Epa, epa! The fastest mouth in all Mexico! I mean, are they still going to be offended by that awesome creation voiced by the late, great Mel Blanc? Who knows? The film doesn't depict an ice raid. It does include a scene that echoes one. Um, <laughs> Cord Industries invades the family's home in a scene that can play as just another dramatic moment in a superhero movie or be taken as a symbolic gesture of events that tear apart real families. See, when I want to go and see a superhero film, I want to see an origin story. I want to see a sequel that lives up to the expectations of that first film. I don't need to see a film where all the Hispanic people gather together and one of them calls Bruce Wayne, Batman, a fascist. Now, apparently that joke doesn't even land because people who have seen early previews have actually said, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like one of those jokes where you kind of hear the sound of crickets in the background. I'm not surprised. Am I going to see this film? No, because the trailer reminds me of Iron Man from 2008. So, and basically this is just DC and the director not having the fresh set of ideas that is ripping off other established IPs that have come before them. And now they're producing their own kind of come and nobody even wants it. So speaking of which, uh, Kevin Smith and that god awful Masters of the Universe Revelation performing so badly that it had nothing to do 
with a live action He-Man being made at Netflix. In fact, it was going to be going ahead with Noah Centineo, uh, who was meant to be the lead role. And I think the guy looks good, but he's in his own TV series. I think it's the, the Night Agent on Netflix, which I've been I've been watching on and off, and it's okay. It's not bad. But of course, Kevin Smith, the same man who thought He-Man came out in 1981, when in fact it was 1983. Uh, even I know that, but God, do we need more reminders of why this was so effing awful? Again, chucking the diversity because, you know, the 80s cartoon and the awesome reboot in the mid noughts you know, that told a story. It had diverse characters anyway. But why do you have to color their skin to make them a bit more appealing to not offend people who might not be white folks in the audience uh, who might suddenly take offense? Do you know what I mean? It's so stupid. But Kevin Smith being the cry baby that he is, he rejects the theories and the speculation came or comes after a report from Variety's Matt Donnelly that the live action He-Man film uh, that had moved to Netflix in 2022 was getting scrapped at the streamer because Netflix is it's not losing as many subscribers as Disney Plus, but it certainly has seen um, a big the descent of people leaving their streaming platform because um, despite the fact you've got South Korean dramas on there and you've got repeats of Breaking Bad, you can watch Ad Nauseam, Better Call Saul, a lot of the so-called original content is just ruining people's viewing pleasures. I mean, for goodness sake, we now have Greta Gerwig, who's threatening to direct not one, but two adaptations for The Chronicles of Narnia on Netflix. Can you imagine how that's going to go, especially when British MPs uh, labelled C.S. Lewis as a right-wing author, just like J.R.R. Tolkien? Are you effing, you paedophile UK MPs? Yeah, I'm calling you guys that because some of you probably are, and also um, sexual predators. So I don't care what kind of Narnia film is going to come our way. I'll watch the old school ones. Even one the ones that had Tilda Swinton and Liam Neeson in them. I'd rather watch those again. Are they perfect? No. But honestly, I would sit through those again. So, Brian Cox, my favourite Hannibal Lecter. And you're thinking, wait a minute, when did Cox ever play the cannibal-eating loving villain that we all love. Well, if you watch Manhunter from Michael Mann in 1986, Brian Cox has about 10 minutes of screen time as the man who loves to eat fava beans. And he was fantastic. But Brian Cox, this was refreshing to see actually. And I thought this guy probably leaned to the left a little bit, but in a recent interview, well, actually it was an interview that was probably about two weeks ago, I think, or well, maybe last week, where, uh, where Brian Cox is being interviewed by Pierce Morgan and and he was asked about whether things are getting worse in America under Joe Biden uh, than they were under Trump. And then when you take into account the influence social media may have had in people's perception of reality, the succession star, by the way, which I'm watching um, or a quarter of the way through the first season is absolutely hilarious. Well, Brian Cox did not hold back. Are things worse now or is our perception of life worse because of things like social media inflaming everything? Well, I think I don't think social media helps. Mm. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it hinders rather than helps. And I think it points up too readily inadequacies mm. that we can actually, and, and the whole woke, well, we've talked mm. about this before, mm. the whole woke culture, I think, is truly awful. And the shaming culture. And the shaming culture. Which I really feel quite strongly no, about. No. God, you remember the good old days? I don't know if we can even actually call it that when Facebook came out in 2005, 2007, and people were just taking selfies and taking selfies was the kind of norm at the time. And look how far we've gotten, folks, where, as Brian Cox and Morgan have actually said, it's all about shaming people, you know, the gym thoughts to get to the gym going, oh my God, that man's staring at me, staring at my ass and my shorts riding all the way up my ass because I want to show that he's a pervert. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do have women who dress like that at my gym, but thankfully they don't go around laying a camera uh, hoping some man will dare to look at their beautifully refined cheeks because 
God forbid we do that as normal men and even normal women who may gaze at the booty cheeks of a finely toned female. So good on Brian Cox for actually shouting out the woke narrative that he hates it. Well, I think we all do by this point. Um, at this point, yes, I do get more laughs and giggles from seeing woke takes online at the moment than going, oh no, what the... F I mean, I do say that funny enough, but now I've gone to the point where I just don't give a flying fig anymore. Now, on to something a bit more optimistic. So this Saturday or Sunday, depending, I'm off to watch the Oppenheimer movie from Christopher Nolan. And I'm going to get to the Rotten Tomato score about that in a minute. However, um, I decided to check the BBFC rating for this film um, because it's the second R-rated movie from Nolan after Memento. And interestingly enough, I was I was kind of uh, shocked by what I saw. So there's strong language and there's lots of sex. Now, if you look at the violence, there's only three out of five moments of violence. Threat and Horror 3, when we get to sex, it's four out of five dots for sex. Now, I don't think Emily Blunt, who plays Killian Murphy's wife, will be getting her kit off, because as far as I know, apart from young Victoria, I don't think Miss Blunt has ever shed her clothes on screen. She's rather demure, and you wouldn't imagine her doing that. Um, but I can imagine Miss Florent Pugh. Oh, hello, Pugh. How are you? That was a bit of an unintentional rhyming there. I think she'll be getting her boobies out for us to see. And I don't think she's ever shown her boobs on screen. Although probably some of you might be telling me now, well, if you watch Midsummer, she did so in that movie. Now, I haven't seen Midsummer, so I can't comment. But if you have, do let me know. And of course, that'll give me an excuse to watch that movie. And, and I like that Florence Pugh, she's a good singer. She, look good. she can look good on the eye sometimes. Uh, but honestly, if she gets her baps out for this film, well, well hey, um, I, I can't wait. But I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan. Uh, the Prestige is still my favorite film of his. Um, and probably a second would probably be the uh, actually Batman Begins. Uh, but honestly, glad for C Killian Murphy. I think the guy's a fantastic actor. He does look like Robert J. Oppenheimer anyway, so that's even more spooky. So... At some point Saturday evening, maybe I'll be going to the cinema or maybe tomorrow, perhaps after work. Who knows? Uh, yeah, I'm recording this on a Thursday. So uh, the cat's out of the bag on that one. But of course, let's go to Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, and what do we see here? All these breathtaking quick snippets. Oppenheimer isn't just an epic masterpiece, but one of the most important films of the year. The most breathtaking film of the year. It's big, it's ballsy, it's serious-minded cinematic oh, savoir-faire. The type of event that is now virtually extinct from the studios. Which is weird because some of these opinions I always see opined in Rotten Tomatoes seems to sway in the opposite direction. Unless Hollywood has a sleeper hit waiting in the wings, Oppenheimer is primed to be the best film of the year. Now, funny enough, if I go back one page, you will see it's got a 93% fresh score, which is amazing. Okay, now you go to Barbie, which I think is getting released tomorrow as well or next week. No, it's tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah, because people are debating what's going to get the biggest uh, revenue stream. And I think Barbie will do really well, despite the fact that, oh uh, yeah, and of course, I saw Jeremy Johns' review and it was hilarious, basically, and I'm agre and agreeing with the bearded bro myself. This film isn't made for me. Why would it be? If you're an alpha bro dude, you ain't taking your missus to go and see Barbie. You're going to be seeing Oppenheimer instead, aren't you? Um, and despite the fact that Oppenheimer is three hours, apparently it's three hours of the, some of those brilliant dialogue and acting you'll ever see. And there's Margot Robbie, very easy on the eye, but the problem is she's a B-movie actress. You know, you can't put her to A um, grade A status and she's going to guarantee to pull people in. She's kind of one of these pro-feminist actresses now because since her debut in Wolf of Wall Street... She's kind of picking out roles that have a bit more of a feminist edge to them. So anytime you see her name attached to a project like this, directed by Greta Gerwig, who's going to destroy the Narnia Chronicles, 
I don't hold that much hope. Apparently, like, the best person in it is <laughs> Ryan Gosling. Oh, wow, a straight white man who's the funniest thing in a movie that hates the patriarchy. Holy shit, wow. I mean, I might end up downloading this movie illegally anyway to watch it afterwards. Um, but as the reviews have said here, Barbie can be hysterically funny with giant laugh-out-loud moments generously scattered throughout. Interesting. Uh, one of the funniest comedies of the year. Uh, but I did see another review here where they talked about it. Like the last hour or so kind of crashes and burns a little bit. Here we go. The moments that just are laughing. <clears throat> at and with the crowd, however, are shoved into long, important monologues that with each recitation dull the impact of their message. Uh, does it stick the landing? Uh, the second half of Barbie bogs down a bit. Ouch, ouch, ouch. And it is described as uneven. Now, funny enough, if I go into Barbie here on the search bar... Oh, now that's interesting. Just a few moments before I recorded this video, it was site under maintenance. But as you can see here, 89%. So, yep, lagging behind Oppenheimer. So quite clearly, ladies and gentlemen... There is only one heavyweight movie to watch this weekend. And Oppenheimer, I will watch. Sadly, not at the IMAX. I will be watching it at my local super screen, uh, Cineworld. So that will do me because you know what? Times are tough. We've got to hold those uh, fingers from going into our wallets and spending it on things that we, we can just restrain ourselves from. And whoosh, that was a long video, folks. I promise to cut it down. We would like to ask the congregation to pause for thought and reflection at this most tragic of times. To remember Jason King, the man who smelt of creed, who loved to shave and then decided to be a man one day and grow a beard. And then realizing that his beard was downstairs, not upstairs. And if you feel this way inclined, ladies and gentlemen, there is a super subscribe button below. If you hit that button and make a donation, all the money will go to Jason's favorite lingerie brand. I mean, the, his favorite charity, which was Battersea Cats and Dogs Home. He was rather partial to pussies, but less so with cats. And on that one, folks, if you were me, and if I were you, you better come back for the next video.